Coming up on the vinyl reacquisition project, I'll go into depth on classic metal albums from Malice, Wendy O. Williams, Keel, Piledriver, Nasty Savage, and Metal Church. Stay tuned. The debut album for Malice was a promising release for a band already starting off on a major label. But could the traditional sound compete with the evolving metal scene of the time? Malice was formed in 1980 by guitarist Jay Reynolds and soon after accompanied by vocalist James Neal, both of whom were previously in a band called The Ravers in Portland, Oregon. Soon after, plans were made to move to Los Angeles to form an all-original metal band and to cut a demo. Once completed, the demo gained the attention of a fledgling record label owner, Brian Slagle, who at the time was compiling tracks for unsigned bands for inclusion on his upcoming compilation album, Metal Massacre, the first title released by Metal Blade Records. Malice had the distinction of having two tracks on the record, both Captive of Light and Kick You Down. Following the Metal Massacre release, Malice went on to record a new set of demos with producer Michael Wagner, who also produced albums for Great White, Dawkin, and Striper, as well as many others. Wagner was definitely a known producer at the time, and a really good fit for them. During this period, a record label bidding war ensued over the band, and from that, Malice was eventually signed to Atlantic Records in July of 1984, releasing their debut album through that label. The album consisted of tracks from the Wagner demos, as well as newly recorded songs with producer Ashley Howe. Recommended tracks are Into the Ground, Air Attack, and especially Hell Rider. Sadly, In the Beginning was never reissued to the vinyl format, but there was a 2016 CD release of the album from Rock Candy Records, if interested. Despite not being a well-known metal band, Malice did tour with a number of big names throughout the 1980s, such as Slayer, Wasp, Alice Cooper, Queensryche, and Saxon, to name but a few. As for what Malice is up to in more recent times, they reformed in 2006 and released their New Breed of Gods album in 2012. We haven't heard much from them in the past few years, at least since a 2019 post to their Facebook page. Sadly, we also lost guitarist and founding member Mick Zane in 2016, who died at the age of 57 from a brain tumor. It's obvious that Malice had a tough time of it being an L.A. metal band that didn't quite fit into either camp when it came to what was popular in the genre at the time. They weren't radio metal like Rat or Dawkin, and at the same time, they weren't thrash metal like Megadeth or Slayer. A number of successful bands fell into this in-between category, but Malice never got the same notice. Even still, In the Beginning is a solid metal album, albeit with a couple less than stellar tracks, but certainly worth checking out. The debut solo metal album from punk rock legend Wendy O. Williams brought with it some of her raw and aggressive qualities mixed with the polish and catchiness of 80s metal, in part due to at least one notable rock star of the time. So it's not unimaginable that Williams would go the heavy metal route, considering her former band, The Plasmatics, had already been blending those elements into their sound. Likewise, members of The Plasmatics are on WOW, including guitarist Wes Beach and drummer T.C. Tolliver. But what about that notable rock star? Well, enter Gene Simmons. In addition to producing the WOW album and co-writing some of the tracks, he also plays bass throughout the album under the pseudonym Reginald Von Helsing. Given that there are also appearances from Paul Stanley, Eric Carr, Ace Fraley, and Vinnie Vincent, it's not entirely inaccurate to consider this a de facto Kiss album at times, and other times as a sort of Kiss and the Plasmatics mashup. Of the songwriting credited to KISS members, two are significant as they were previously KISS demo tracks and were later recorded and put out on official KISS releases, the tracks being It's My Life and Thief in the Night. Of course, Wendy's version of the former is truly inspiring and has way more punch than the KISS versions, either from their 1982 demo or especially the comparatively lackluster outtake from the Psycho Circus sessions. Favorites are Bump and Grind, Ain't None of Your Business, and of course, It's My Life.
Speaking of which, a music video was made for It's My Life, featuring Wendy destroying a house with a bulldozer and engaging in full contact wrestling, as well as escaping a moving car by climbing a rope ladder attached to a plane flying overhead, right before the car goes off a cliff. Amazingly, all of these stunts were performed by Williams herself. The most recent vinyl reissue of WOW was released by MVD Audio in 2015, copies of which are fairly easy to find online and at a good price. Of course, if you're a solid fan of Wendy O and her music, not to mention her onstage antics or her appearance in the movie Reform School Girls, let me know in the comments below. Although the album was treated as a sort of curiosity by many fans at the time, it's hard to deny that Williams was a real force to be reckoned with in the realm of 1980s heavy music. If you dug late period plasmatics, or even the non-makeup era of Kiss, or even both, you'll likely find something of value on this record. Also, rest in peace, Wendy O. Checking out the photo on the back of their debut album, you might expect Keel to be a run-of-the-mill hair band from Los Angeles, but their sound was far more informed by traditional heavy metal, and even with some hints of early speed metal. Lay Down the Law would also be the start of a rather respectable career for the band throughout the 1980s. Keel's story actually begins with vocalist Ron Keel's previous band, Steeler. Steeler's self-titled and only album, featuring guitar legend Ingve Malmsteen, was certainly a musical predecessor to Keel's self-titled band in some respects. When Malmsteen left Steeler four months after joining to go out on his own, and a succession of lineups followed, Ron Keel decided that the band wasn't going to get any sizable recognition, and so he disbanded Steeler and formed Keel. Late on the Law was released by Shrapnel Records, who, perhaps not so coincidentally, previously released Steeler's album. Ron Keel pretty much had free reign over the entire production, which later attracted the attention of Gene Simmons, who produced their second album, The Right to Rock, two months later. Oddly enough, it was during the production phase of Lay Down the Law that the band got signed to Gold Mountain Records, a subsidiary of the major label A&M Records. So things moved pretty fast for this band. Of course, it was also 1984 and L.A. hard rock and metal bands were getting snapped up by the majors in the wake of the success of such local acts as Quiet Riot, Dawkin, Rat, and Motley Crue. Notable songs include Thunder and Lightning, Tonight Your Mine, and Speed Demon. It's all I need to get to where I'm going fast. Speed Demon. I can hear the highway scream. Speed Demon. Can you feel the thrill of my machine? My only complaint with this record really is the cover tune. Late on the Law ends with a rendition of the Rolling Stones song Let's Spend the Night Together, which they actually perform again on the second album. It's really just filler tacked on the end of an otherwise great album. Currently, there have been no vinyl reissues for Lay Down the Law, but in 2008, Shrapnel Records did put out the album on CD in a digipack, the first time the album ever made it to the compact disc format. It really is a shame that Lay Down the Law, and perhaps even Keel in general, get lumped in with some of the blander elements of the pop metal scene of 1980s Los Angeles. The band had much more in common with more aggressive and energetic local acts, such as Armored Saint, and yes, even Malice, than most of the glamier acts of note. And although some material later in the 80s gets a tad formulaic, you really can't go wrong with both this album and its follow-up, The Right to Rock. Check them out. The debut album from Canadian two-man project Piledriver wasn't even supposed to be from a real band. From the onset, it was a record label idea to make money and see what happened. Of course, what happened was an undeniable classic in underground metal circles. Piledriver was formed by relative unknowns Gord Kirchin and Leslie Howe, known in this release as Piledriver and Bud Slaker, respectively. Howe was looking to form a recording project that would not be a touring band and brought in Kirchin for vocals. The two had played in a bar band earlier in the 1980s, which is how they initially met. Another person who had an active hand in this idea was Cobra Records manager Zoran Busick, who thought that any album with a halfway decent album cover would sell at least 20,000 units, so that was his motivation. Given that, publicly perpetuating the idea that Piledriver was an actual band served as an effective marketing ploy. Further deception can be found in the band member listing. Howe performed all instruments except for Kirchen's vocals, 
though Sal Gibson is sometimes said to have played bass or simply written some of the lyrics and melodies. That aside, both Knuckles Akimbo and former Lee are pseudonyms for Leslie Howe. In fact, the drums are actually a drum machine programmed by Howe. And there was also Kirchen's crazy metal wrestler type mask he wore on the front and back cover to obscure his identity. Of course, all this anonymity might remind some of classic Kiss, but the comparisons obviously stop there. Standout tracks are Alien Rape, Pile Driver, and the title track to Metal Inquisition. The lyrics of the title track should also be mentioned because they are both awesome and ridiculous. Lines such as, So if you're in a disco or in a country bar, you better get the hell out, we know who you are. As well as, Where the Metal Inquisition were not too hard to find, don't get any closer, we might just blow your mind, are worth the price of admission alone. Hell, I'm still trying to figure out just how one can be arrested in the name of hell. Unfortunately, the label felt that American distributors wouldn't be able to handle some of the song titles, so the version of the Metal Inquisition album that many American metal fans got back in the 1980s had Sex with Satan renamed Lust, and Alien Rape changed to Alien Raid. The band dissolved in 1988, but from 2005 to 2019, Piledriver returned, this time as an actual band, largely due to the demand of fans. At this point, the band is now known as the Exalted Pile Driver, to distinguish it from the plethora of other Pile Drivers, with Gord Kirchin as the only member from either of the 1980s lineups, performing some live shows but not releasing new material. Sadly, Kirchin died in 2022 of lung cancer. Rest in peace, Pile Driver. The latest vinyl reissue of Metal Inquisition was released in 2022 by Shadow Kingdom Records, including live versions of Alien Rape. Metal Inquisition, and Sex with Satan, which is to say that all censored track names have returned to their original titles. While some question whether this project was a tongue-in-cheek deception or a serious metal effort, Metal Inquisition remains a classic, for better or worse, and it should be heard in the spirit of that contradiction. Because of that contradiction, let me know in the comments how you feel about Piledriver and Metal Inquisition specifically. The second album from Nasty Savage continues the ferocious and thrashy style captured on their debut record, as well as being rather well received by the metal underground of the time. One label that gets stamped on this band is often that of Unique, something Indulgence further exemplifies. With its angular riffs, odd lyrics, and the histrionic vocals of Nasty Ronnie, you always know what band you're hearing, and more importantly, what band isn't trying to be like the others. They definitely have their own thing. Speaking of which, we should discuss the cover art, and more specifically, the artist. Louis Vanderkar was a Miami painter whose own life was as odd as his artwork. He called himself Magus Supreme, pro tem of the Supreme Order of Magi, and thought himself someone with mysterious powers, specifically ESP and the power to levitate. He hinted about incarnations and said an alien entered his body as a young man. He also claimed to have a pet poltergeist, then tried to sell it through a classified ad. All of which sounds like the man who should do Nasty Savage album covers. And he did most of them. Sadly, Vanderkar died of heart failure in 1988 at the age of 75. But I would definitely encourage you to Google Vanderkar because he was clearly an entertaining character. Tracks to check out include Incursion Dementia, Triple X, and Divination.
Nasty Savage went through a few breakups starting in 1989, but the band had most recently reformed in 2016 and are still reported to be around. The last studio album Nasty Savage released, as of the time of this video, was Psycho Psycho in 2004, their fourth full-length album. There was also a 2019 compilation album released by FOAD Records in Italy called Wage of Mayhem Plus Rarities, 1983 to 1985, and in two vinyl variants, if interested. As for indulgence, Metal Blade did reissue the album in 2016 on vinyl and in three colored variants, two of which hand-numbered and limited edition, with also a poster. One curiosity I've noticed is how some modern reviewers seem to all have a very different idea of what subgenre Nasty Savage fits in. I've heard thrash metal, death metal, heavy metal, speed metal, and power metal. The truth might lie in the band's embrace of styles from many of these, or in some cases, actually inspiring other bands in at least a couple of those subgenres. Wherever you choose to place Nasty Savage, Indulgence shows the band evolving a bit more in terms of tighter performance, as well as in the songwriting department but still maintaining that aggressive edge from their debut record. Worth a listen. The second album from Metal Church finds the band on a major label, with more professional production and touring with bigger acts. But does this commercial success leave behind the band's original sound and vision? As the story goes, Metallica, who were close friends with Metal Church, urged Elektra to sign the band, since Metallica had already been on that label for a couple of years at this point. It was likely no accident that Metal Church also toured the dark in support of Metallica shortly after. Another connection between the two bands is in the album's dedication, which pays respects to Metallica bassist Cliff Burton, who was tragically killed in a bus accident nine days before the release of The Dark. Production for this album was handled by Mark Dodson, who later produced State of Euphoria and Persistence of Time for Anthrax. Though perhaps more impressive is engineer Terry Date, who recorded albums for many great metal bands, such as Sanctuary, Overkill, Dark Angel, and Pantera, to mention but a few. Some reviewers, notably modern ones, give this album a lot of flack for being overproduced. I feel that it suits the material here fairly well, and the naysaying is often rather overstated. But how do you feel about the record's production? Let me know in the comments below. Preferred tracks include Ton of Bricks, Start the Fire, and the title track, To the Dark. A music video was released for the track Watch the Children Pray, which was a bit of a doomy power ballad with moments of classic metal church heaviness throughout. The video received frequent airplay on MTV and was likely responsible for pushing the dark to number 92 on the Billboard 200, spending a total of 23 weeks on the charts. Of course, this would be vocalist David Wayne's final album with Metal Church until a brief return in 1999. Around the same time as Wayne, founding member and guitarist Kurt Vanderhoof would also leave the band, at least as a performing member, but would stay to write songs for them. Vanderhoof would also return to full capacity in the late 1990s, where he remains in the band to this very day. The most recent vinyl reissue of The Dark was released in 2022 by Music on Vinyl and came in 180 gram silver vinyl, limited to 2,000 hand-numbered copies. Metal Church has always been a prime example of how a band somewhere between traditional heavy metal and thrash can make these two styles work seamlessly. And although The Dark is a bit more polished than their debut, its track variety, Wayne's improved vocals, and heavy riffs make this one a bona fide classic. You should already have this one in your collection. So let me know what you think of these classic albums. Were you fans of them when they were new, or maybe you discovered them more recently? Maybe you prefer different albums from these bands. Let me know that and anything else relevant in the comments below. Of course, if you enjoyed this program, please like, subscribe, and share. And if you're tuning in for the first time, my name is Matt. This is the Accusation Network, where each and every week I do videos on metal vinyl collecting. I also cover the subjects of classic and modern metal in general. If that sounds good, definitely check out my playlist. I do tons of shows in and around those areas. I think you'll dig them. Anyways, also, if you've been watching my videos for a while now and would like to give a little extra support to what I do, consider becoming a patron of the Accusation Network. 
Go to patreon.com slash the accusation network. There you'll get exclusive content as well as early access to all of my videos up to seven days early, as a matter of fact. Just go to the page, check out the reward tiers, and see how you can contribute. And as always, see you next time.